what's new on the Burlington waterfront. Hey, now it's happening at the waterfront on Lake Champlain. Whatever the weather, there's so much to do on the new waterfront, the Burlington waterfront. Welcome to On the Waterfront. I'm your host, Mariah Riggs. And this month, I'm excited to have da Sal Di Francesco, who is a very dear friend. We actually share a birthday, um, who agreed to come in uh, and talk with us this uh, month about his amazing uh, variety of things that he has done over his life, as well as um, his current role uh, working with the Vermont Blues Society and the music industry in Vermont. Sal, welcome, so welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. So um, really quickly, I just wanted to uh, introduce you to our audience. Um, I know you've worn a lot of hats and done a lot of really awesome things throughout the years. Um, quickly, just uh, you're not from Vermont. Um, how did you end up in Vermont? Well, I went to St. Michael's College and starting in 1967. And um, I met my wife, uh, I think it was 1969. Um, I think it was love at first sight. Uh, it took me a little while to wrangle her a bit, but uh, we got married in 71 and uh, decided to live here. We lived here for the, till 1978 and then went down to Connecticut for about nine or ten years and then came back in 86. Why did you come back? Uh, we wanted to buy a house. Um, this was a good place. I was traveling by air for most of my business and uh, there was an airport nearby, made it easy. Plus, her family was here, so it was. Oh, that, that, that's a big one. Yeah. That's a big yeah, one. That was, my family was in Connecticut, her family was in Vermont, so it worked out. I'm glad we got you. Thank you. <laughs> I love it here. So, uh, currently, um, Sal uh, is very involved in the music scene, which we're going to get to, but I, I actually am kind of excited to take a little bit of time here and kind of delve into your background. Sure. Um, so, uh, so originally, um, you had uh, you had some interesting uh, jobs prior to getting into the music industry. Um, one of my favorite is the fact that you, at one point, uh, worked in jewelry. Can oh yes, that? that was a long career. Um, I started out with interest in jewelry. I made I made our our uh, I made my wife's our our, our um, wedding bands, and I learned that in Connecticut when when I was down there and. That's because I had a motorcycle accident, so I lived there for a year before I came back up. And um, when I, we came back up, I went back to school again because I had missed a year. And uh, I started to get very interested in jewelry. So we had this business called, which you don't see, called Depths of the Earth in, um, in Shelburne, in the center of Shelburne, where we made jewelry. It was sort of a fun, but it was kind of a failure. And uh, I took that and I started to work for... Um, Preston's Jewelers doesn't exist anymore, but that was an established, they've been there for a hundred years. And then I took a job, we went down to Connecticut, took another job and started working in the industry there and then ended up in New York, which I found out I was an okay jeweler, but I was a way better stone salesman, so that was much more fun. Selling stones? Yeah, I always tell people it's the closest thing to selling drugs, but legal. It's very expensive stuff, and uh, I specialized in um, I specialized in ruby, <laughs> sapphires, and emeralds. I worked for a Swiss company called Gole Bruchel. That was a lot of fun, actually. Can you do validations? Uh, you mean like like um, look at something and estimate cost, or well, not, not now anymore. because okay. the, it's changed. But actually, that's an interesting uh, concept because one of the things <laughs> working for Gole Bruchel. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is, because they were a Swiss company, they could deal with um, everybody. You know, we, we dealt with Arab nations when we had an embargo in Vermont, you know, um, but the Swiss didn't have that. Yeah. So there was a lot of times where we were getting jewelry from Oscar Hyman. By the way, Oscar Hyman used to uh, sell to Tiffany's, Bulgari's, etc. It was always so much fun to go into those places because we walk in and there's <clears throat> a double door in jewelry, mm -hmm. in the jewelry warehouses or wholesale. There's a double door. So you go into like an, sort of like an airlock yeah. and you have insurance, you're, you're bonded. Mm -hmm. So we'd be in there and we'd be sitting on a table and there'd be like 
five, six, and this is an $84, so $86. Yeah. They have five or six million dollars worth of, of jewelry, to, and it'd be falling on the floor, and we'd pick it up and throw it around. <laughs> and it was just so much fun because it's, it was a commodity at the yeah. time. One of the things, my, I was talking about the diamonds, one of the things that the, um, uh, the Swiss did is for a, a male, I had actually a good, I have good color sense, I'm mm -hmm. not colorblind. And we used to take, um, they'd, they'd buy an investment stone and I had a friend at the GIA, the Gemological mm -hmm. Institute of America. And they bring in a stone that would say like five carats and it was a, I don't know if you know the numbers, but mm -hmm. D is the most clear and then it was an E and F, et cetera. So they bring in an E or an F stone and they'd say, take it to your friend and see if you can get it down to a, an E or a D, depending on if it was an F or an E. And I usually, like about 60% of the time, I could talk him into reevaluating it to a better color. And you'd make, you know, on a, in those days, in a, in a three to five carat stone, you'd pick up, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a carat just by changing the color, by changing the valuation of the color. So that was one of my jobs. Like, I, I was pretty good at getting um, the investment stone to increase in value. Wow, that's significant though, a three-carat three piece, oh, yeah. that's a lot of money. Well, when you get into those stones, they're, even for diamonds, they're relatively rare. And, uh, and you know, the, the color is very, um, very, very clear. But I mean, you have to be very, you have to be trained to, mm -hmm. and you have to see them a lot to see the difference between like a DE or an F stone. Most people can't see that. Yeah, in your eyesight. Is that why they wear those little monocle things that they like look at the stone with? Well, actually, um, that's usually for jewelry making, um, and that's changed to a binocular view. Yeah. That's what most people use. But um, when you're looking at a stone, you're um, like that. You're mm -hmm. using um, a fairly high power hand loop. Okay. And they're little teeny things. Some are this big, and the smallest one is like that big, wow. and that goes up to like 40 or 50 power. Wow. And so you have to literally hold it like the stone is literally an inch from your, hand, your eye because of the focal length. And that's when you can see defects and things. But when they do it with diamonds, they literally put it under a microscope because the flaws are um, how impossible. they vary them. Yeah. That's crazy. And, and I assume just, I mean, just for yucks and giggles, older stones, um, do they have a lot more... Um, a lot more, uh, you know, cracks and fissures. Or are they just not as clear because of the old cuts, or is that kind of a false well, assumption? Well, it depends very much on what stone you're talking okay. about. So, yeah. if you're talking about diamonds, diamonds are very durable. Yep. I mean, they're the hardest substance. Mm -hmm. um, they're ten on the on the uh, ROM scale. What is that? I can never remember the name anymore. Um, and being carbon, they uh, they don't really change. They're one of the few stones, actually the only stone that I can heat up red hot, so it's glowing. And if I don't dip it in water and let it heal, heat, uh, cool naturally, it won't do anything to the stone. You couldn't do that with an emerald or. So the thing about emeralds, the precious stones are much different. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually much rarer. The ruby sapphire emeralds are much rarer than a diamond. Huh. Especially the special colors. Really? Yeah. So you so you have, I didn't the, know that. you have pigeon blood red. Yeah. Um, you have safflower blue, mm -hmm. and uh, well, Kelly green is actually close enough. And those are the three major. Um, and pigeon blood, you just they're not mined anymore. They're in uh, where Burma was, mm -hmm. and they just don't exist. And wow. um, pigeon blood is a is a is is a very red color. All the stones you probably have seen are definitely not pigeon blood. I'll, I'll show. I have one. I'll show you at the end of the yeah. show. Uh, I, you know, so cool. I love so, the color. So wow! So the semi-precious in a lot of ways are a lot rarer than a than a diamond ring. Well, precious stones. Yes, precious stones. Yeah, semi-precious is different. <clears throat> but even some of the precious semi-precious used to be called semi-precious or not. My favorite stone, if you were going to ask me, is the alexandrite. It's my favorite stone. And what does that look like? Well, alexandrite is a barrel, so it's related. Uh, well, it's a, sort of a barrel. It's a chrysoberyl, so it's it's related to the to the other barrels like uh, aquamarine and emerald. But okay. um, what I love about alexandrite is it has just enough chromium oxide 
uh, to change color. And chromium oxide is actually green, mm -hmm. but in a crystal structure, and keep mm -hmm. in mind crystal is actually a very distinct uh, molecular structure, um, with just the right amount of chromium oxide, you get, um, you get an emerald. With just a little bit of chromium oxide, you get a ruby. That's red and green. But an alexandrite straddles the two. And so under incandescent light, mm -hmm. which is more yellow or sunlight, mm -hmm. it looks uh, red, but, uh, actually purple. But under in, in, uh, fluorescent light, mm -hmm. it changes to a more um, blue uh, Well, color. fluorescent is a different color temperature. Right, and yeah. so that those temperatures flip mm -hmm. the stone to a different color. Wow, so the and spectrum. So, the yeah. spectrum is based on color temperature. Yeah, and if you ever want to, if you ever want to see those examples of great uh, precious stones, obviously the Smithsonian is where you go. Yep, one place. Or, or the what about the Natural History Museum in New York? They have some, but the best collection is by far the Smithsonian. It's well, good to know. Yeah, I've never checked that out, and they're all free. They're fun. If you ever want to go, Washington D.C., they're oh, free. Yeah. They're awesome. You gotta love that. Um, so you so you did that for a while. I did um, do you, for a do, long do, time. Do, do you use any of the information anymore or not? I still have connections. Okay. Um, I have some jewelers that are st we're still friends. Yeah. And if I need a deal on a diamond, I know where to go. Oh, I need to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> now I know. Uh oh, my significant other might be in trouble. Um, no, I'm joking. Um, so, uh, so after you did that, you uh, you had always had a. Um, I, I understand you're a flyboy, and you've always been interested in flying. Well, yeah, I was flying models when I was 12. Okay. And uh, I got I got a lot involved in model airplanes, which is mm -hmm. my business, Northeast Sailplanes. I started flying hang gliders in when I was 26, and uh, I kind of love that it's a little bit of a danger especially in the beginning when we were first flying it was much more dangerous than it is now hand gliding oh yeah i've lost wow. a lot of friends well because it's kind of i mean that's you just kind of jump off things and go with the wind right well that's a common misconception okay <laughs> you, you have control <coughs> you do have turning capacity with oh it, yeah or? i mean there's no there's no way you could ever fly an aircraft without the, I mean, the only thing that you can't turn is a balloon. So there's a rudder? Uh, no, there's no rudder. A flap? No. Okay. The old hang gliders, I mean, there's some modification, um, are set up that they're moderately what they call unstable, so they, um, so you use weight shift. So really? if so I if shift, move? if I shift, I'm uh, uh, there's a bar in front yep. of me, triangular. If I'm shifting this way, it's going to turn this way. If I shift this way, so it's going to turn this way. It's like a bank against the wind. Kind of a bank. Yeah. You're, you're changing where the CG is, and the CG is making it roll. Oh, that's wild. Yeah. That's super. Now wild. they have a, a lot of hang gliders have um, surfaces, some surfaces, hmm. and I've flown several of those as well. When was the last time you got out? Um, with my sailplane, it's probably been close to 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. You still have it? No, no. Um, I owned um, a 304CZ, a Czech airplane. Um, and sailplanes are mm -hmm. very expensive. Okay. Like a uh, supercar, mm -hmm. uh, expensive. And they're extremely impractical because you can't take anybody with you, especially when you're... Paying for an airplane, a sailplane like that, they're single seat mm -hmm. and they barely fit you. You, you, you're, you're sitting mostly lying down. Oh wow! Yeah, and the canopy is about this far from your head. Matter of fact, you take off the. Uh, if, if you want to see a sailplane pilot, yep. if he doesn't have this beanie, he's a sailplane pilot. It's that tight. Well, it's the canopies in those mm -hmm. days ran five to eight grand, so. Mm -hmm. First of all, you don't want to hurt yourself because it'll drill into your head. That hurts because of the turbulence. But mostly, you don't want to crack your canopy because it's expensive to replace. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. And how many, I mean, I'm assuming hundreds of hours up in the air? I have about, I have a, like something like 3,000 hours in ultralights. I have somewhere in the vicinity of five to 600 hours in, in um, hang gliders. And in sailplanes, I don't know, I'm close to 1,000. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot of time up in the air. Yeah, but I have friends that are, uh, you know, that before they were airline pilots had 10,000 hours. Now they have 30, 40,000 hours. Okay, well, you know, 
It depends on the yardstick you're measuring yourself against yeah. everyone else with. And there's nothing worse than a, a doctor with a, a pilot's license. Why? Um, they're the most accident prone, primarily because a doctor who's gone through years and years of school thinks he's extremely competent and he thinks he's competent in other things. Mm -hmm. And typically doctors don't get enough out enough to practice, mm -hmm. so we consider them semi-dangerous. <laughs> But as as an entire group, <laughs> in a sail in an airplane, yeah. If they don't fly enough, are they a big demographic who choose to go into? Well, yeah, because they um, they have the money yep. and uh, they don't have a lot of time. So, flying around is something like they're they interested in. Yeah, I, I prefer the group that I always liked is I like the Vietnam. Uh, the vets. Yeah, they were great pilots because they know how to fly. Yeah, we perpetrated a hoax on all of, uh, of um, New, the uh, lower New York State for years, actually. A, a hoax? Sorry, you have to explain yourself a, now. A legal hoax. Oh, goodness gracious me. What did you do? Well, I was involved, <clears throat> I should say, a bunch of, of um, pilots, especially um, Vietnam pilots, would take up their single seaters or two seaters mm -hmm. or three or four seaters and they they were putting lights on the uh, landing gear and on um, on the on the bottom of the airplane on the wings yeah and they put these spotlights and they would fly in formation at 5000 feet and they turn all the spotlights on so it looked like an alien craft yes and the and the thing about <laughs> the interesting thing about people at night is you have no depth perception you don't know yeah. that but you don't so so you, we would get reports from weight planes <clears throat> and then Stormville, New York, where, oh, they were hovering and then the, suddenly they're in white planes. Well, they were 5,000 feet and you could see them from both places. The FAA came in. I remember because I was flying an ultralight and I cut them off on, uh, on, on their approach to the airport. I didn't get in trouble for that. I was surprised. But they were, they were all um, uh, Kore uh, North Korean, I mean, K um, Korean war pilots. Oh, wow. In those days, if you were part of the FAA, you were uh, a pilot typically. Now mm -hmm. it's a lot of pencil pushers, but in those days. They yeah. came in, they interviewed the pilots, they laughed, <laughs> got back into their airplane and flew back to Massachusetts. <laughs> and they said, you're not doing anything wrong and we're not gonna tell on you. <laughs> That's hysterical. Yeah. That's quite the hoax. It was quite the hoax. I was actually interviewed for it. That's and, kind of impressive. I, I might, I might use your story. You watch out. I might tell some people about. I that. was on the cover of Discover Magazine. The back of me. I wouldn't let them take the front of me. Okay. And they still said it was ultralights, and I said, "No, we can't fly at night. It's not ultralights." What did they? Oh, what was it? It was airplanes. It was real, plane, real airplanes. Plane, 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 plane. But you know, to this day, if you look it up, you'll see that people still believe it was UFOs. Well, I'll have to. I'm looking it up now. Oh sure. Totally checking that one out. So, so if you, I mean, and uh, just really quickly too, um, you know, uh, so you're you're involved. You have you have a you have a plane company. How did you start getting involved in the music industry in in Vermont? Okay, so at the time I was in very good shape. I'm probably 40 something pounds lighter than I am right now. And uh, my wife and I were doing a lot of uh, cycling. I was doing a lot of weight training. I was buff actually. And my wife um, has been always wanting to sing, but she was always afraid. If you knew my wife, that's kind of an unusual thing because she's not afraid of anything. But apparently she had stage flight, fright for years. In the beginning, before we were, about the time we were married, there were people that heard her voice and wanted her to do backup singing and things, but she said no, which was good for me. But um, one day we were at a friend's house and um, we were having dinner and, and he had a garage band. He said, why don't you come out and play? And she said, okay. And she did that and then there was a, um, a blues jam in uh, Richmond. Uh, used to be one at the, uh, I can't remember the bakery, but um, on the rice. On the rice, thank you. You so, remember it, and so I, I grew up with them. So she, okay, so she um, uh, she uh, was invited up. Mm -hmm. She heard they uh, she was singing. She sang one song, sat down and cried for like ten minutes, and uh, then slowly but surely got her. Uh, uh, she started out with a garage band, and then she got invited to another a band called um, Spider Roulette. Uh, which he played with for a couple of years, and then uh, decided to go solo, and she asked me to book her, 
And I said, well, hon, I'll do it for you because I love you, but I'm going to the dark side if I start selling again. And that's what I think of it. When you're selling, you're on the dark side. Some people have a natural knack. I unfortunately do, and, <laughs> and that's the problem. But it's a different personality than yep. when I'm relaxed. And yeah. That's how it started. So I started booking her, and people saw my success, mm -hmm. and they started asking me to book them. And, you know, a lot of solo artists would ask me to book them, and I said, well, I'll book you. I'm not going to charge you because... What am I going to make in this in this day and age? You're lucky to make a hundred dollars for a gig in a journeyman capacity. I'll I'll take a you can buy me a beer. Well, I got celiac disease, so I couldn't have the beer either. <laughs> um, but I started booking a few people just to help them. Um, I booked a few bands here and there. Um, I've worked with Dave Keller a little bit. I've always helped him. Uh, I've worked with uh, the Woe Doggies. I've worked with um, Starline Rhythm Boys. Mm -hmm. Um, for a little while, I'm, I'm, I, I like booking my wife, but when, I, when, that's when did this all start out of curiosity, timeline wise, timeline wise. Uh, so my wife, I'm trying to remember, uh, she's been doing it about 11 years now. Okay. So this is recent, recent. Yeah. Wow. So you really got involved in the music industry recently. Yeah, that's my personality. I make friends everywhere I go, or enemies, but usually friends. <laughs> Frenemies? Frenemies, yeah. <laughs> and go. so then I, you know, I started uh, getting more, she had various uh, reiterations. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, as long as I'm doing this, I should probably, I'd like to do talent buying instead of booking. Yeah. And so I, I offer that service to diff different venues. Okay, so to our audience who might not be aware of what talent buying is, how would you describe that? Okay, so booking is selling, talent buying is buying. So if you're selling, it's like my wife, I'm going to venues and say, you should have her. That's selling the service, mm -hmm. okay. Talent buying is the opposite. I'm, I'm gonna say, okay, you're a great musician, I'm gonna book you for these dates. Mm -hmm. That's buying the talent. Okay. Most okay. people call it just booking, but the truth is one's booking, one's talent buying. So there is like, there is a nomenclature difference between the two. Yeah, it would be like um, a salesman on, on the floor of Macy's versus the talent buyer. I mean, the, the, the buyer, buyer that buys the... That's like, okay, we're doing Jordash. Right, exactly. So right. that's the difference. Yeah, yeah, that's a significant difference. People like me much, they have to like me much more as a buyer than a seller. <laughs> Because <laughs> they have to like what you're buying, what you're selling, right? It's yeah, and I average this time of year three or four phone calls a day, just wow. uh, people wanting. That's great. Mm -hmm. So it's busy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can only book so many, but it's usually people that know I'm going to book them. You know, I mean, I guess that's the other thing too. And as people watch this, I think it's important to think about is, you know, I think some of I've heard, you know, in, in around town and from from musicians and stuff that sometimes the hardest part of being a musician is getting booked gigs and getting out there and doing publicity and getting a mark in the music scene. Uh, do you have advice for them? Well, um, it's really difficult to, I talk to people about this all the time. Um, first of all, you need to, you need to have um, some music and these days it has to be a video. Mm -hmm. Assume the buyer is, um, has the attention span of a goldfish. So you wanna assume that they're not gonna look at anything. So long intros are an out. Don't okay. do that. I see a lot of people, they have these nice long intros and then the heavy duty part of the music starts. Mm -hmm. so eliminate the, the intro, start out with heavy duty because this person's gonna listen to it for 20, 30 seconds and make up their mind. So that's number one. Number two is you have to be, you have to kind of, as far as approaching the venue, you have to kind of decide how, like, there's a fine line between being a pest and being, um, you know, getting mm -hmm. in the door. Um, unfortunately, most venues don't have what I would call qualified buyers. Mm -hmm. um, I always say that they, they find the bartender that's the laziest and they find that they got to do something with that person. So they make them the, the, the talent buyer. Wow. Um, you know, it's funny in this day and age, we have, you know, emails and texts and we have Facebook messages and, you know, and actually the phone. And it's the least amount of communication now. People just ignore everything. Really? Yeah. I find the, the only way to, to get a, um, uh, a talent 
buyer to is to catch them in the right mood at the right time and personal is personally is better <laughs> and I usually recommend if you're a musician and you're a serious musician mm -hmm. you're probably not a great um, seller well you know we we talk about this a lot in the art world some of the best artists are the worst publicity PR marketing people and and then some of the like the most successful artists are just really good at marketing and advertising. They're not necessarily the best but artists. But they're just not the best artists. It's no. like, you know, it's like you can just go fall back on something like, well, Van Gogh. I mean, there's a classic example. He died penniless, but was a genius. And unfortunately, they don't go hand in hand. No. And artists are very much like that. Plus, it's, a, it's incredibly soul sucking to have some unqualified youngster. I'm old and I'm going to be like that. Uh, say to me, say to, not to me, but to, to anyone that I don't, I don't think your music is, I don't like your music or it doesn't fit or something like that. And I can certainly take that mm -hmm. because, you know, I'm a salesman. I take it personally, but I get over it. Um, a musician, it's just hard on them. Mm -hmm. And so I recommend, one of my biggest uh, recommendations to m musicians is don't book yourself. Yep. Find a family member or find someone who's a salesman. It could be your wife, could be your girlfriend, could be your cousin or your mm -hmm. uncle or your niece or whatever that can actually deal with it and let them do it and you'll be much more successful. Because it kind of protects you, it creates that buffer. And they're going rejection. to be more dedicated to it and yep. they're going to say things that you may or may not be willing to say. And it's their opinion. They might not necessarily know your family. And you're like, oh, but I really love them. And it's amazing what somebody who's not part of the band telling exactly. you that will do for the sales strategy. Exactly. Of getting it out there. That's an interesting point. But also get a video that, that works. And it's these days, it's not hard to make one. Just, just on don't YouTube. make it with an iPhone. Well, actually, iPhones, strangely enough, are kind of OK. OK. But don't. I see a lot of videos with people that are bands and it's in the middle of a live performance and somebody's taking a video and all you hear is the crowd and the, and the sound sounds like it's talking through like, like this. <laughs> I'm going, that's not going to promote your music. Sounds like it's through a water slide. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Do a nice video and... Uh, Make you sure know. you get audio out. On, on whatever recording you're, I mean, if you're playing live, get a get a out channel so you can actually get the proper mix of your well, music. Well, the proper too. mix is when if it I sounds so much better. I do some video recording for people, mm -hmm. um, and I tell them, I don't like. I know you want me to do it live. I'm not crazy. I, I'm I'm I think they're better in the studio. I know you don't have the energy quite, but mm -hmm. it's just better sound. And I and I record off a board multi track, so yep. they're coming into the board. Um, it's coming into my my computer in separate tracks, and it's not quite what you do in a recording studio, mm -hmm. but it's close enough. Well, that's I mean, and that's another thought too. Is like you know, not only is it getting the bookings out there, you know, I mean, what do you see as far as like the recording industry right now in Vermont? Well, there's a lot of small studios. Yeah, there are some of them are quite good, and some of them are okay. But it's amazing. I feel like in the last 10 years, there's been, and maybe that's the technology, making it more available for people. Well, I mean, you, I, I have a home recording studio. I mean, it's not, it's basically my living room and it works because it's dead and it's good enough. Yep. But yeah, there's a lot of new players, um, mostly digital recording. Yep, yeah. Um, people are still trying to use the old analog for the sound. Yeah. But there's so such a high failure rate with the older equipment that mm -hmm. uh, that gets to be problematic. Yeah, you start getting that signal noise. Well, it's not just the signal noise; it's just like, you know, you know, tubes fail, and you're in the middle of a <laughs> recording session, and you didn't know that this particular piece went down, and so you've gone through all this work, and next thing you know, you're going to wait two months to get another tube. If yeah, you're vacuum lucky. tube, and you have to find out an SD because they don't make them anymore. Well, especially since most of the vacuum <laughs> tubes are made made in Russia. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. And That's they're very interesting. far superior, by the way, to transistors. So you're on, uh, you're on the board of the Vermont Blues Society. Yes. And I thought you should take a little moment to promote the Vermont Blues Society. What do you guys do? How did it start? If anybody's interested in the Vermont Blues Society, how would they get involved or, or find out more information? Well, first of all, that part's easy. You go to vermontbluesociety.org, and uh, there's our website. Okay. Uh, we have a Facebook page, Vermont Blues Society. 
uh, which I maintain mostly. Um, it started with some founding members. Uh, Dennis Wilmot was one of them. Sandy Combs was another. Um, that uh, Charlie Frazier, you might know yeah. that name. Yeah. Uh, they were the founding members, and uh, they wanted to have um, a, a club that really promotes blues. Mm -hmm. And so our our goal is to promote the local talent, mm -hmm. uh, to bring in, to have some events. Uh, we have our our um, our annual meeting. We have. Um, uh, you think I would remember the name of it, but it's um, some lovely events. You just had one at my facility. It was a that was two people weeks ago. People loved that event, by the way. Um, it was wonderful. Uh, we bring in some. We bring in some local. Uh, we bring in some local people. We bring in some mm -hmm. uh, people from out of town, and we do the. Um, uh, there's National Blues Society, which okay. we're a, a branch of, of, I guess you would call yeah. it. And each year um, they have a. Uh, you, you, we run a competition, mm -hmm. and the winners, it's two categories. One is um, a solo duet and then anything up from there, and the winners go to Memphis, wow. and they compete in, the, uh, in the, um, the national competition. That's so cool. And it's a great experience. Uh, typically, we send them, and then we start raising money to get them there. <laughs> and, uh, but it's... it's uh, That's wonderful. It's nice to know that there's that grassroots, yeah. uh, you know, up, uplifting like people in blues in Vermont because it is, um, you know, <clears throat> between uh, bluegrass and blues, it's it's kind of an indicative um, music in Vermont. There's a lot of blues in Vermont. Yes, um, and a lot of bluegrass. Yeah, and a lot of bluegrass. Mm -hmm. it's, it's real. Um, really quickly, I, I did want to kind of segue. I know we're running out of time. Um, and how we know each other um, is doing the Main Street Landing uh, Thursday night music series. Mm -hmm. Um, which is uh, every Thursday night um, on the back patio of Union Station, which is directly above the train station on the Burlington waterfront. Uh, we do a Thursday series uh, starting at 5 o'clock all summer long. And part of the reason why I exist is because Sal is so remarkable at booking oh, our bands for us. Um, which has been a really fun collaboration. Yes, yeah, it, I, I've enjoyed it. But let's talk about that patio for a minute. Okay. Sometimes I want to call it the secret garden because it's on the main floor from the front and it's on the second floor from the bottom. It's kind of a split level. If you walk around the back, there's this really cool half round cobblestone patio that is just the perfect place. And I wish more people knew where it was. Well, it sounds like Sal just gave you instructions. Yeah. So that should help <laughs> tremendously. Just walk around the back of the building, and it's right there. You'll hear music. You'll be hear, hearing music on uh, Thursday evenings all summer long back there. We got some great line. I got Carubo, by the way. You so did? I all just, right, I cool. Did, Any, uh, what other bands we got going on this summer? Uh, we have uh, Blues. Um, Blues Over Easy, which is kind of a super group with uh, Paul Asbell and Jeff Salisbury. Um, Clyde Stats. Uh, we have, um, I'm trying to remember their names. Uh, we have the Ray Vega Band. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, Blues for Breakfast. Yep. Um, that's a good it, it's, it's a good. It's a good, it's a good example of what we're doing. It's going to be fun. It's yeah. going to be really exciting. So uh, come check that out this summer. Very good idea. So I wanted to, I have this interesting, I got a great list of questions from your wife oh. before I interviewed you. <laughs> and I'm really curious, what are the five Fs? Oh, well, Food, what, fishing, flying, something, and then what, what are Finagling. They? Finagling. Well, okay, the, so the, the one that you said something is a four letter word that starts oh. with F. Oh, goodness. Oh, well, we can't do that until then. Yeah, but I can I, say. Wow, honey. <laughs> well, I, I made that list That's when adorable. I was in my 20s. Okay. Oh, wow. Really? So this has been like an ongoing thing for Well, I love fishing. I love flying. Okay. I love food. Uh, food. Okay. I love, yeah, and, and, well, I mean, yeah. I'm a male. Yeah, Why wouldn't yeah, I love yeah, the yeah, other yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. And finagling is what I do. Finagling is the term for... You, you are a master finagler. Right. I, I would actually say, you know, maybe that should be like your title, master finagler. Of... People have called me that more than I want to. <laughs> more than you care to admit. Yes. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So fishing, I mean, maybe that's another reason why I ended up in Vermont. Oh, I love fishing. It's a great place for it. Yeah. I haven't fished a lot in the last few years, um, but I, I, my favorite, actually my favorite place in, in Vermont is the Upper Huntington. I just love the, you know, where the three pools are, where people 
Yeah, Skinny triple dip. buckets. Yeah. I, 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 just I, you above know, I'm that. from Huntington. Uh, that's why I said I, knew, yeah. I figured you knew it. I know it a little bit, yeah. Yeah, so I love the just north of that, like as you go past the pools. Yeah, yeah, of course. And yeah. there's great fishing there. And now, uh, you know, we actually have names for those, just so you know. Someday we'll have to do a tour. So after Triple Buckets is there's Sandy Beach and then there's Pebble Beach. We oh, yeah, yeah. There's, the, the, there's names for all yeah. of those spaces. And um, I, I've been fishing there since I was in my 20s, so. That's wild. Yeah. And I've always loved fish. I mean, I, there's something about a little trout stream, a little brook trout mm -hmm. stream that's just wonderful. That's super cool. Yeah. So you, um, so you know, I was, you know, if somebody's watching this, right, and they're, they're trying to start a band mm -hmm. in Vermont or in Burlington, what would your advice be for them as they were trying to get their name out and trying to book gigs and break into the scene that we have locally? Well, that's always a tough one. But here's the best, my best advice is get very practiced. Mm -hmm. don't, don't mess around with that. Yep. Make your, um, instead of a performance, mm -hmm. well, instead of playing, make it a performance. This is an issue I have with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, okay, I've got, I've got my set list, I'm gonna play 20 songs, mm -hmm. and that's it. No. The, the people that are very successful, like Chad Hollister, for example, mm -hmm. is a good one. He's a showman. Yep. And so you need someone to relate to the audience, to make it a little special, do a few things that, uh, that make it, you know, first have the musicianship. You have to have that. But, mm -hmm. but make it a little special so that you're doing something different, maybe something funny, maybe something exciting in the middle of that performance. And if you go to... Uh, if you go to some of the national performances, that's exactly, well, we won't get into how far that's gone, but, <laughs> yeah. but you see that. Yeah. And, and, and I think that makes a difference. Yeah. And try not to uh, take too many free gigs because you will always be branded with that. Of so once you go, too cheap. well, spoken like a true booking agent, once you take a free gig, it's all downhill from there. Is that the? Well, you might take a few. <laughs> I always say if you need free gigs, you want to play, mm -hmm. try to get charity gigs because okay. at least you're getting real exposure. Mm -hmm. But doing something for food or drink, mm -hmm. they're just never going to book you for more. It's just the way it works. Well, you're also giving your art for free and, and, and we all know that that's a slippery slope. Yes. Because it's hard to charge more when you're already giving something away for free. And I've, I've known several that I consider successful artists now that are having a hard time moving up because they got the reputation of giving it away. Yep. Even though they're really well known and they're doing albums that are selling and, and things like that, they just can't quite move the dial very oh, much. So that almost in some ways creates like a glass ceiling, some sort of yeah. a, a way that you can't grow. Yeah, my wife has done a ridiculous amount of gigs in a year. And what is your wife's name? Cooey. See, then we need to know that. So when you see Cooley, Cooey, and I'm looking at your website. Yeah, everybody says Cooley, Cooey, Cooey, um, <laughs> Cookie. It's it's all of those without that consonant. Cookie without a K. And if you go to, and L. if you go to that website, you can find out where she's playing because she plays all over the state. Yeah. Well, I'd go to the Facebook page because I haven't been, been been very good with the, with the website oh, lately. Oh, thank you for disclosure. <laughs> I'm just admitting it. <laughs> Yeah, at least you're honest. Yeah. Well, uh, Sal, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming here. Uh, thank you guys so much for uh, joining us this month. Um, thank you, and I'll see you right back here next month. Take care.